1996, James Leo Nichols, the Honorary Consul for Norway, Denmark, Finland, and Switzerland, died in insane prison within two months of his arrest. He was serving time for having an unregistered telephone and fax machine, which was suspected to have been used to convey correspondence to and from Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, the death of Norway's honorary consul in the notorious insane prison was a turning point for Norway, which stepped up support for Burma's democracy struggle and helped secure 10 years of political and economic transition, which was disrupted by the military's coup attempt on 1st of February, 2021. The coup has been met with unprecedented resistance and determination. People of all ethnic backgrounds across the country have united, not just to oppose the illegal regime, but also to, pose for an, to push for an inclusive federal union. Unfortunately, the junta's escalating violence and campaign of terror against the people as it seeks to gain territorial and political control has plunged the country into a nationwide conflict and economic crisis. During the past four months, armed clashes and attacks on civilians in Burma, Myanmar were higher than Syria and Afghanistan combined. This month, Norway holds the presidency of the UN Security Council. The Norwegian presidency's priorities are women, peace and security, as well as the protection of civilians in conflicts. Both are intensely relevant to the crisis assailing Myanmar today. I am still waiting for our host, Jostein, uh, our moderator, Jostein, to enter the room. Um, but I, what I might do is to um, launch into um, uh, moderating this very distinguished panel of speakers. And um, because we have five wonderful speakers and only an hour, we also hope there's time for Q&A. We hope that um, all our speakers will be able to share with us um, five minutes, that they will contribute five minutes of their perspectives of information analysis, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, I think everyone in the room is conversant with Zoom and have already started using the Q&A function. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to invite, to um, introduce Minister Susanna Lala So, the National Unity Government Minister for Women, Youth and Children's Affairs. She was elected Karen Ethnic Affairs Minister for Yangon Region in the 2020 election and was Myanmar Member of Parliament during 2015 to 2020. Minister Susanna, as some of you early birds found out, uh, was, was, is actually a, an art teacher, but she is also very well known for her activism for women and child's rights and she was the first Myanmar woman to win the Interaction Humanitarian Award in 2020. Welcome, Your Excellency. What should Norway do to support the protection of youth and children affected by Myanmar's escalating conflict? Over to you. Thank you, thank you, Debbie. And thank you, the, all the organizer who initiated this important event. This is very timely event. Indeed, Myanmar is an emergency situation in all fronts. Much has been written and reported with evidence about the deteriorating political, humanitarian, and security crisis in Myanmar since the Myanmar military tried to steal the power from Myanmar people about a year ago. Uh, <clears throat> nearly one year after Myanmar military staged a coup, nearly 1,500 civilians have been brutally tortured, burned and alive and killed, including the country's most previous assess, university students, politically and socially conscious youth, talented artists and children. More than 12,000 have been arrested and charged or sentenced 
more than 30 young men and women are being verdicted to death sentences. Elderly, pregnant women and children were not spared from being arrested either. The entire population is living in each day under fear. Various reports show millions of people, including pregnant women, elderly, disabled people, children, have fled their homes and relocated to IDP camps along the country's border and the area controlled by ethnic armed forces going under hiding. No place in Myanmar is a safe place anymore. Many cities and villages have been burned to edges. Since March, the general has launched at least three dozens of indiscriminate airstrikes in over 20 townships in Sakai Magui regions and Chinkachin, Karankarini, and Shan State, killing civilians and children, destroying schools, hospital clinics, and IDP camps, and displacing hundreds and thousands of people. Such area attacks against civilians among breaching of the Geneva Convention and international law, war crime and crime against humanity. Four days ago, in January 16 alone, the gender indiscriminate airstrike in Karini State killed six civilians, including two IDB children and three AIDS workers. In the Christmas Eve massacre in Karini killed 34 civilians, including two international NGO staff and four children. Now let me elaborate how Ministry of Women, Youth and Children is doing for our people. Last year, our ministry could help 50,000 pregnant women with cash transfer, more than 300 prisoners, including underage children with emergency support and legal protection, protect the women who were sexually violated by military with temporary shelters, medicines, and counseling, and support education for IDB children. Of course, we did these programs with the support of our Myanmar people diasporas and international community. Some diplomats, they use the term, Myanmar has two governments, but I would like to reject that Myanmar, in Myanmar, we have only in one legitimate government formed with elected representatives, ethnic and youth leaders. Myanmar military is not government. They are terrorists who choose to attack their own people. My recommendation to Norway, who is UNSC president this month, and international community to use your utmost, utmost diplomatic pressure to protect our people and save lives. We call the international communities to cut weapons and jet fuel imports to Myanmar, cut the financial flow to the gender, and stop gender atrocities to, against the Myanmar people. The UN Security Council must impose and enforce a comprehensive arms embargo on Myanmar now. Last but not the least, please allow me to end by saying that the national uprising we are seeing today is organic, born out of genuine desires by the people from all walks and lives. We want to be a peaceful country and a good neighbor, making good contribution to make this world a better place. We. People of Myanmar, we will fight till the end to bring absolute end to the military dictatorship in the country. We also need the support of the international community to stand with the people of Myanmar and on the side of the justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Susana, for that, uh, uh, for that very short but concise overview of how children and youth and the general population, civilian population, have been affected by the junta's uh, brutality. Um, it's now uh, my pleasure to also introduce Ms. Yasmin Ola, a Rohingya feminist, poet, and social justice activist. She was president of the Rohingya Human Rights Network and is now a board member of Oxian Burma. In 2021, Yasmin Ola was listed by the Gender Security Project's 2021 Feminist 100 because of her work on women, peace and security. Oh, uh, Yasmin, you have the floor for the next five minutes. 
Thank you very much, Debbie, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my special thanks to the organizers for including me in this webinar. Um, it is extremely well known that women are continuing to be threatened under the junta. And this is true for Rohingya and for any other ethnic communities in the country. However, the longer the attempted coup goes on, there seem to be less attention um, from the international community and less actions that follow suit. I want to highlight um, one of the things that just happened um, at the end of the year last year. At the end of December, the junta arrested 77 Rohingya in Thongu um, Township, Rakhine State, while they were traveling from Rakhine State to Yangon in, on December 22nd. And, um, 100 out of nine, um, sorry, 109 out of 20, uh, 228 Rohingya who were arrested on 29th um, of November were also sentenced um, to five years imprisonment with the Immigration Act at 13. The level of oppression um, towards Rohingya people have not changed. And the junta um, just recently jailed 33 adults and, um, you know, 25 of them were women um, out of these 77 people who were arrested um, in December. These people were trying to escape the, the effects of genocidal campaigns in 2017. And because that has so many different ramifications and, and you know, issues around livelihood, people were still trying to flee from their homeland because they they don't know better. They don't have any other options. And with the country, you know, descending to chaos as it is right now under the attempted coup, um, the deterioration of women's peace and security issues um, have taken place over and over again. As a Rohingya, I believe that you know, our community is one of the clearest examples that you can find out there of what could go wrong in the absolute sense if we continue, you know, the current global trends where we just let things be and and don't address them um, head on uh, and, and, you know, address the, the root cause of the problems. The one of the most damaging of the trends that I referred to just now is the culture of impunity that we allow to happen, which essentially gave rise to the ability to commit genocide. How a genocide is carried out is not just by way of killing. Um, it's not just the killing off of Rohingya and the deaths that happen within our community, but it is the destruction of the collective identity, the culture, the political, social, and economic power, and the most effective ways that the military has figured out to do all of this is leading up, um, which leading up to, to the Rohingya genocide is to destabilize the community in a very, very gendered way through sexual and gender-based violence, as well as racialization through legal and social segregation. Currently, through its pursuit to suppress the will of Myanmar people who rejected the, you know, the, the coup and the attempt to take away their democratic rights, it has replicated many of the tactics that was used against Rohingya and has been used against um, ethnic communities, especially women and girls. I want to repeat this well-known fact that, you know, that needs repeating as many times as it needs. All issues are women issues. And when mass atrocity take place, they disproportionately affect women and girls. I hope and pray that, you know, we, we take a more intersectional approach to all of this, that we take in class, we take in, you know, racialization, we take in the, the, the issues around um, uh, ethnic communities being destabilized um, into heart when, when we try to address issues within Myanmar um, community. As a Rohingya woman, we know all too well how my own sisters and others um, from diverse background have been affected disproportionately by the coup and by the military junta regime um, prior. Now, a very, very specific, um, very heartbreaking uh, example of all of this is the the occurrence on February um, you know 
after February 1st um, uh, of the junta trying to um, suppress the the ability for people to protest and, and trying to get their reign of power back, um, they've actually detained a lot of people in my um, my co-panelists will be talking about that, but a very, very specific example of, of how many innocent people are implicated in all of this is uh, a story of a six-year-old girl who had been shot dead. Um, she was one of the youngest victim, known victim of the crackdown. Um, and that was very, very early on in the, in the, uh, during the attempted coup, um, I think one month right after February. Her name is Kim Myochit, and her family, you know, spoke to many, many news organizations that she was killed by the police while she was running towards her father during a raid of their home in the city of Mandalay. Many other women have also been shot at point blank range um, in the head while fleeing from the gunfire. Many of my, um, act, many of my fellow activists on the ground, the people who have risked their lives every day are either on the run um, or are constantly being threatened by the, by the risk of being arrested um, by the junta. And this, as we already know, it actually disproportionately affect women from the ethnic communities in the rural area. And I hope and pray that Norway would become more focused on its commitment to women, peace and security, especially in the, the, the case of women from Myanmar, um, it still has a chance. The violations of women have continued and will continue. It isn't enough for the Security Council to constantly fear the veto power from the permanent five, or we continue to fail our fellow sisters, my fellow sisters who risk their lives every day for the greater good. And it's important that we emphasize the women's issues encompasses more than just sexual and gender-based violence. If houses, village, communities, and our country are destroyed, you can guarantee that women are going to be disproportionately affected for a very, very long time. We need arms embargo. We need so many other you know, actions from, from Norway and its allied nations, as um, Minister Susanna has already previously mentioned. The frustration of women activists on the ground um, is beyond measure. They feel like they have been betrayed by the Security Council over and over again. Um, we cannot continue to insist that women are protected while they are continuing to have to risk their lives every day and can't see the commitment being matched, even 1% even by the Council. Um, the junta does not actually fear women. They actually fear the Security Council. So it should... The Security Council should live up to its commitment to, towards peace and, and security for women. And Norway has been an important stakeholder in many, many resolutions. So it should materialize and actualize some of these plans. Um, if a weak and compromised resolution continues to be passed, this is all that we're going to see. But we deserve better as a country. We deserve better as a people. As a Rohingya, I can confidently affirm that there is absolutely no reason why the genocide and the violence that have occurred to us bears repeating. Okay, I'm world... going to cut you off. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Sorry. Can you just finish your sentence? Yeah. Uh, this is actually at the end. If the world, specifically member states and Norway, sit idly by again, we have failed each other in the most cruel sense. We, the people of Myanmar, deserve better from you all. And we deserve protection. We deserve not to live through violence and wars waged upon our safety. We deserve a chance to rebuild our war-torn country into a more democratic federalism upon which human rights, women, peace, and security is at the top priority in the truest sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, I, uh, my, the next speaker is Ken Omar, a dear friend. Um, Omar, are you ready or do you need um, a little bit of time? Are you ready? Can I introduce you? I guess so. <laughs> I mean, at least I'm, I'm already uh, connected, so that's good. Okay, 
So it's always a pleasure to introduce a very old and dear friend. I mean, old in not in terms of age, but in terms of length of knowing each other. Um, Kin Omar is a veteran peace and security advocate and founder and chairperson of Progressive Voice, uh, a research and advocacy organization. Uh, she was awarded the Anna Lind Prize and was co-recipient of the Vital Voices Global Leadership Awards for Human Rights in recognition of her work. Omar, can you share with us the humanitarian impacts of the violence that we've seen in the past year? Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Um, well, as we know, it's been nearly a year since the military made this coup attempt through extreme violence. So as a result, the humanitarian and human rights crisis has become catastrophic. According to ECRAD, there were 7,686 armed clashes and attacks on civilians since February last year. Between September to December, these clashes and attacks were comparable or greater than incidents in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Syria, which are on UN Security Council's agenda. Leading up to one year since its military's uh, coup attempt, this hunter has intensified its military attacks in Karen, Karani, Chin, Zagai, and Magui, with increasing use of airstrikes against civilians and internally displaced peoples. In the last few weeks, Karani state has faced some of the most unspeakable violence at the hands of the military, in particular, the massacre and burning of over 35 people on Christmas Eve, including children and two staff of Save the Children was horrific. Subsequent offensives in Karani involved fierce airstrikes, displacing over 150,000 people. That is over half of the population of that state. Airstrikes are also ongoing in current state and have already driven nearly 50,000 be 50, people from their homes with thousands to seek refuge on Thailand border. Dozens of shells have landed in Thailand, demonstrating how this Myanmar military's attacks are becoming a regional and global threat to peace and security. Zagai and Magui regions have also faced some of the military's worst crimes. The the military troops have been raiding and burning villages to ash, using villages as human shields, torturing and cutting throats of those that they arrested, airstrikes and indiscriminate shootings, massacres and burning of the bodies. In Chin, Shan and Kachin, cases of rape and gang rapes being, uh, by the Honta soldiers have been reported. Children are increasingly falling victims to the military's war crimes. Just this past Monday, the military used airstrikes near Pruso IDP camp in Karani state, killing three IDPs, including 12 and 15 years old girls. In Chin state on January 9, bodies of 10 civilians who had been taken by the military as human shields were found. The youngest was a 13 year old boy whose clothes were ripped off from his body. These brutal attacks showed that the military hunter is nothing more than a colors terrorist group. A matter of, as a matter of urgency, Myanmar people really need an immediate halt to the air and ground attacks, lifting off the military's blockade of those seeking to escape the onslaught of violence and access for those seeking to provide aid and shelter. As we come to mark one year of the military's attempted coup on February 1, in action by the UN, particularly by the Security Council, whose actions have been stymied by Russia and China, has further emboldened the military to intensify its attacks with blanket impunity. Following the Christmas Eve massacre in Karani state, the council issued a press statement stressing the need for accountability for this act. First time ever. But this must be followed by action. It is vital the council refer the situation of Myanmar to the ICC. Other countries, including Norway, must follow the example of Argentina and bring forward universal jurisdiction cases against May Online and members of the terrorist hunter. The council must impose global arms embargo and targeted sanctions against the military, its businesses and businesses of its cronies, as well as its network of arms dealers. 
The junta continues to weaponize humanitarian aid for its own political gain, blocking and destroying humanitarian aid and attacking humanitarian and medical workers and human uh, medical facilities. It decides the flow of aid to communities, making humanitarian agencies party to a strategy of collective punishment, while also lending the hunter legitimacy it desperately wants. Nothing is neutral when working with this military hunter. When, what Myanmar really needs is a principal humanitarian engagement that genuinely does, do, does no harm. Lending legitimacy and allowing the hunter to decide who gets help is harmful to the people, to the peaceful future of the people of Myanmar that people are striving for. Norway must ensure that the people of Myanmar can have access to humanitarian aid through alternative solutions, including cross-border aid through local civil society and community-based organizations that have the trust from the affected communities, capacity, experience, and expertise guided by the principle of do no harm. After a year, the hunter has been unsuccessful to take over Myanmar, despite its fierce campaign of terror. They've killed at least 2,164 people, including over 100 children, and arrested 11,638 people. Over 8,500 remain in detention. In conclusion, what I would like to say is that the people of Myanmar are risking everything for the protection of human rights, democracy, and peace, and the future of their generations. The question is, what will UN Norway and other democracy countries do to support the people of Myanmar and stop this terrorist hunter. And I'll stop here. Thanks, Debbie. Back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Omar, for giving us that picture. And now, with the first three speakers, Minister Susanna, so Yasmin Ola and Ken Omar, We've, we're seeing um, a very big picture, but also understanding that this in, in the midst of this violence in which 2,164 people have been killed around the country, most, uh, we, we see that young people, children and women, especially from an intersectional lens of ethnic minorities and rural people are suffering disproportionately from this violence and the UN Security Council can do so much more. Um, I'm, I, in case you noticed, I am not the moderator, Jostein Kobelvel, the uh, executive director of the Rafto Foundation for Human Rights. There's been an update of Zoom and it's created a glitch. So we're waiting for Jostein to join us. I'm Debbie Stothart, coordinator of Altsian Burma. And um, I would encourage everyone to take the opportunity to start posting your question in the Q&A uh, box while we listen to the next two speakers. So uh, next up, I'm honored to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Kasit Piromia to the panel. He is a board member of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights and a former foreign minister of Thailand He's a very, very experienced diplomat and also served in the Thai parliament as a legislator. Your Excellency, welcome. The international community seem to be relying on ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations to secure progress on this crisis. Do you think this is the way forward? Please unmute and share your thoughts for the next five minutes. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, it is the duty of the ASEAN community to help fellow member when that fellow member encounters difficulties. And at the same time, the international community has been waiting for the ASEAN to achieve some progress on the Myanmar crisis. But now I think we have to come to the conclusion that the international community, as well as our Myanmar friends, democratic forces, cannot go on relying on the ASEAN community as a whole. For the very fact that I think one must come to the realization that most of the members of the ASEAN community are authoritarian. So it is quite inconceivable to see any authoritarian regime or government 
telling the military junta in Myanmar to behave in a democratic manner. So there is this inbuilt structural inhibition or difficulty of ASEAN as a whole. That's the first point. Second, it has been proven during the past 11 months that there is a split within the ASEAN community. I could uh, try to put it into, say, three parties altogether. The first one is the inaction member state, namely Brunei, Laos, and Vietnam, for the very obvious reason, because they are totalitarian or authoritarian. They are undemocratic, so they don't want to do anything. They are not in the position spiritually, ideologically, to help the Myanmar people restore democracy. Then second, we have the, I think, the more progressive member states of ASEAN, namely the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. But I think the four of them do not have the, I think, the joint forces to push the rest of the ASEAN to move and to put pressure on the military junta. Then the third group is Cambodia and Thailand that I think uh, have a close association with the junta leaders, especially the Thai government, which again came into being eight years ago through a military uh, coup d'etat. And the military leadership in the so-called 4C democracy of Thailand at the moment have uh, both the family relationship, military to military close relationship, so uh, Thailand which it should be, I think, the uh, forefront country to help solve the Myanmar uh, problem has been more or less, I think, in uh, implicit collusion with the military junta. It's a, a bit shameful, and my apology to all of this for the, I think, present behavior of the Thai government. So my, my point, my conclusion is that, so the international community should no longer rely on the ASEAN ability to help solve the uh, Myanmar crisis. And thus the responsibility or the burden to solve the crisis must move to the international community, namely the United Nations. And within the United Nations, its first and foremost body, the UN Security Council, which is responsible for peace and security legally for the international community as a whole, must take up the mandate from now on. And in that sense, I think under the leadership of Norway at the moment in the UNSC, we hope that the Norwegian government will play a very active role. I just sent a letter to the ambassador permanent representative of Norway at the UNSC, urging her and her country to convene a special session of the UNSC as soon as possible to look at the Myanmar crisis. And hopefully that Norway throughout her presence at the UN Security Council for the months to come and so on, will continue that active role. <laughs> there is a need for the UNSC to come in. It's because of its legal mandate. And at the same time, its responsibility to peace and security and because of the failure of ASEAN as a whole. So I think the responsibility must come to the UNSC and we have to continue urging the UN Security Council as NGOs, as uh, I think members of parliaments, as political parties and so on. And in this context, the ASEAN Parliamentarian for Human Rights, APHR, all along, I think we have been uh, pushing uh, fellow parliamentarians and governments and so on to act in unison in bringing about the, I think, uh, the decision on the armed embargoes, provision of the humanitarian assistance through the auspicious and coordination of the United Nations and so on, and to do, I think, targeted sanction. We have been pushing this all along, but we will continue uh, to do so. But now I think we don't have to keep on uh, providing members of the UN Security Councils with facts and figures and so on. I think they have had enough. They have their own respect. The embassies in, in Myanmar, they know what's going on. What is being needed for the members of the UN Security Council is to act. And I think Norway as the present chair of UNSC still has the time to push things forward for the Myanmar people, for democracy of Southeast Asia uh, as a whole, and for the international peace and security. So this is what I would like to, to urge 
uh, the Norwegian government through our meeting here to lead the, the way and so on. Norway has an excellent track record in the promotion of democracy, human rights, uh, protection of women and children and so on. Although it is a small country, but it has been working out of its own size and proportion and so on. And why not to really help solve the Myanmar uh, situation? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajahn Prasit. Um, um, and the ne next up we have Mr. Chris Sadoti, a of, who was a member of the UN Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar, the first body to highlight the links between Myanmar military's economic interests and its atrocity crimes. In response to the coup, he co-founded the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar with, with fellow fact-finding mission member, Mr. Marzuki Darisman of Indonesia and former UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar, Ms. Yang Hee Lee. Mr. Sidoti, what can Norway do to address the emergency in Myanmar? Over to you. Thank you very much, Debbie, and my apologies for joining late. Um, I, I had trouble linking in or coming in through, through Zoom, so my apologies. A year ago, in February, March last year, after the military launched its coup, young people in their tens of thousands were marching in the streets of the major cities of Myanmar, uh, including Yangon, uh, Mandalay, Naypyidaw, and many other cities. To my surprise, many of them were carrying signs, large signs, saying R2P. R2P referring to the responsibility to protect, uh, an important principle endorsed by the UN General Assembly almost 20 years ago, a direct response to the Rwanda genocide in the 1990s. Um, R2P, the responsibility of the international community to protect people when their most fundamental rights were being violated in their own countries, and those countries were showing themselves incapable of providing protection. I was amazed that these tens of thousands of young people in Myanmar had ever heard of the responsibility to protect. But I was pleased that they had heard of it and pleased that they were expecting the United Nations to honour the commitment that it had repeatedly made over the course of the last 20 years to be the ultimate protector of people from atrocity crimes. The hopes of the young people of Myanmar were dashed. Not, not dashed so far as Myanmar people were concerned. Uh, indeed, a year after the coup was launched, it has not been successful. The democracy movement in Myanmar is alive and strong and continues to resist the military. So the hopes of the young people have been supported by the people of Myanmar generally, but their hopes have been dashed by the international community. Responsibility for that lies first and foremost with the UN Security Council, because it is the body that has legal responsibility first and foremost for international peace and security. This is its role under the United Nations Charter, to ensure international peace and security. And it has to be acknowledged that the Security Council is a dysfunctional failure. Certainly a dysfunctional failure in relation to Myanmar, an organ that has dashed the hopes and the legitimate expectations of the people of Myanmar. There is much that the Security Council could have done as part of its responsibility for international peace and security. The Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, of which I'm a member, called very early after the coup was launched for an international three cuts strategy. Cut off the arms supply to the military. Cut off the cash flow to the military. Cut off the military's longstanding impunity and make it accountable. The Security Council has not done this. In fact, to be perfectly frank, the Security Council has not done anything. 
It has never passed a resolution in me on Myanmar, in spite of the decades of atrocity crimes being committed there, not once. It has managed from time to time, very occasionally, to issue a presidential statement, a few press statements, but that's the best that it can, can do, that it has been able to do. Norway is currently a member of the Security Council. It was a member in 2021 when all of these events in Myanmar were occurring. And its chair, president of the Security Council this month, the Norwegian presidency presented a real opportunity to involve the Security Council more in the Myanmar situation. But that's not an opportunity that we have yet seen Norway seize. Earlier this week, the Security Council had a debate on women, peace and security. Myanmar's permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Chomotun, whose courage since the coup has been the subject of widespread international comment and respect. Ambassador Chomontum was not invited to address the Security Council on women, peace and security. The Security Council is going to hold a session next week on the protection of civilians in armed conflict. Like women, peace and security, this issue, the protection of civilians, lies at the heart of the problems of Myanmar and the gross human rights violations occurring there. Will Ambassador Chumuntun be asked to address the Security Council on this issue? It seems not. There is discussion, only discussion, of an open debate on Myanmar on the 28th of January. Are we likely to see anything productive coming out of that? Again, given the track record, no. Where does Myanmar stand on all this? What plan, if any, does Myanmar have to break through this long-standing deadlock, this long-standing dysfunction in the Security Council of which it is currently the president? Norway certainly can seek to draw on its traditional strengths in relation to human rights. Norway has been the leader in dealing with the issues of human rights defenders specifically, and the freedom of association, freedom of assembly, and freedom of action of civil society more generally. These are important issues that Norway has taken up. Perhaps one role that Norway can play in the Security Council at this open debate on the 28th of January is to try to shift the debate in the Security Council to these issues in which Norway is traditionally strong. We have not seen much debate in the Security Council on human rights defenders in Myanmar or on the situation of civil society in Myanmar. Maybe there Norway can take the lead and maybe there the dysfunction of the Security Council can at least a little be mitigated. Maybe we can see for the first time a resolution on Myanmar come out of the Security Council. There's 11 days left in Norway's presidency of the Security Council. There are 11 months left in Norway's membership of the Security Council. In the terms of international organisations, the Security Council is the A-League. Um, it's the big league. Norway has aspired to be a member of the A-League. But so far, to be frank, there's not much evidence that it belongs there. There's not much evidence that it's capable of effectively working with the large states, the permanent five and other members of the Security Council to achieve a result. There's a very big challenge lying before Norway for the next 11 days and the next 11 months. Will it strike out and play a leadership role in the Security Council in relation to Myanmar and find creative ways to break the deadlock? Or will it simply be a bit player that is complicit in the Security Council's dysfunctional failures? We'll know by the end of the year. Thanks, Debbie.
Thank you so much, Chris. And I am absolutely delighted that our official host is in the room. Jostein Kobelveld, the executive director of our host, the Rafto Foundation for Human Rights. So everyone has heard, we've had five amazing speakers very concisely telling us that it's time for the Security Council to act. And Norway has a lot of responsibility, a lot of expect, we have a lot of expectations of Norway. I'm so glad to hand over back to you, Jostein. Back to you. Thank you very much, Debbie. And thanks to all the speakers. And also, uh, I think to, to Chris here for also at, at the end, they're highlighting the urgency and also the expectations to Norway, both in its role at the Security Council as, as a president of the Security Council, and but also for its long-term uh, engagement with Myanmar and on human rights. I'm sorry for the delay. I'm not sure if it's because there's a snowstorm around me here in Norway as I'm sitting now, uh, that we have some technical issues, but um, I'm glad to be able to join you and have listened in uh, to the panelists. And now we have a Q&A session. And uh, as we have received some questions here, and we would like to, we will continue about 15 minutes over time. And there are some questions that that, that would like to uh, ask the panel to respond to. And and two two of the questions goes on you know, sort of what what tools are there in the toolbox? And and there is one question here about if it's possible to have a no-fly zone over Myanmar and why hasn't that been implemented? And also there is a question here about how to stop arms support to the junta. Are there any anyone who wants to, like to respond on that? Um, yes, um, Your Excellency, uh, Kasitz. Yes, um, I, I, I'm speaking, uh, I think on behalf of the Thai NGOs, we have, uh, written several open letters to the Prime Minister of Thailand. And we have been on occasions uh, meeting with members of Parliament of Thailand, as well as with the, I think, security agencies of Thailand. And all in all, we have been urging the Thai government to declare, you know, the no-fly zone along the Thai-Myanmar border. And uh, so far, we have not had the response as yet from the Thai government. And as again, I would like to link this inaction of the Thai government to the fact that the Thai government, most of them are former military uh, people and so on. Uh, I think very much uh, like uh, brothers in arms with the milit uh, military junta of Myanmar. So that's a difficulty. But nevertheless, we are pushing the Thai government to declare the no fly zone because it uh, infringes on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Thailand. And at the same time, I think the Thai villages along the Thai-Myanmar border have been affected. And we have told the Thai government, you keep on talking about security, but you have not been protecting the Thai security by not telling the military junta to keep their military aircrafts uh, a few kilometers away from the Thai-Myanmar border. So we are trying uh, to do that. And then hopefully we could work with all of you to keep on pushing the Thai government to speak directly to the military junta in an unknown certain terms that this military operation by air along the Thai Myanmar border must stop immediately. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, are there other in the panels who would, would like to respond on this on either no fly zone or arms embargo? Uh, yes, um, this is very important. Um, I was in the, um, in the, like, in the ethnic area uh, last two weeks ago and uh, visiting the hospitals and also see the, like, maternal care clinics and so and so. I saw so many villagers are relying on this uh, ethnic, ethnic health facilities based in the border area. But after I, I moved to another area, next week, the airstrike came and attacked that hospital. The first time, it's destroyed the house that I used to stay. 
the second time and third time, it became totally destroyed of that, that hospital. So in my uh, presentation, I also ask the, the, the country uh, who concern uh, not to sell the jet fuel to the military hunter and also uh, the, the, um, the weapons because it is, it is uh, brutally attacked to the villagers. They violate the Geneva Convention. They commit the, the, the uh, crime against humanity. So they target the hospital, target the schools, target the clinic. So uh, uh, I hope that uh, the world leader will uh, know and then stay away from um, supporting the hunter. This is very important. Now they don't have much like uh, the, the, the uh, soldiers to fight in the, in the ground. So they uh, use uh, the airstrike in, in totally destroy the villages. And they also use the parachutes. Last week, they use a lot of parachutes to uh, cover the, 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 their operation in Chin and in Korean State and Karini State. So they, they use like as a like big operation to the, the people of Myanmar. It's so, it's really bad. Thank you, thank you. And I think that really underlines also the, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges and, and, and the consequences of what's what's happening now. I see there are some of the questions coming in here that that also addresses, you know, how much the Security Council can do. We know we know there are. If you're looking at the 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 attacks on civilians in Myanmar over the eleven months, it certainly is uh, is a situation that is comparable to what we see in Syria or Afghanistan, uh, but. Uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't get on the agenda uh, some of the commentators and speakers here are asking what that saying that china and russia will stop any any kind of uh, effort to do this uh, but still we have other countries are getting on the security council agenda where you have similar dynamics are there any way that we can go about this any way that we can uh, any experience or any comments on, on how norway can um, make sure that Myanmar gets on the agenda, both within the next 11 days, but also with the remaining part of their time at the Security Council. Hello. I, I think the point is that there is no rules against uh, Norway not tabling the issue to the attention of the UN Security Council. And it's not on Norway, you know, beside the permanent five uh, United States, UK, France, China, and Russia, there are, I think, another 12 non-permanent members of, of the UN Security Council. And it's not only Norway, the rest also should not just sit and doing nothing. I think they have, because they are there in the UN Security Council, they have been lobbying themselves before they get the vote and so on. And once they got, they have to deliver and the things that they have to deliver is peace and security. So, so I think we have to urge the rest also, but Norway is in a very viable, in good position because of her reputation all along and so on. And it is highly respected. So Norway can raise the issue. And even if her, the Norway's chairmanship to end at the end of this month, but she sits there in the UN Security Council. She can still continue to raise the issue and make the Myanmar issue alive, but not only in the UN Security Council. She also could raise this at the UN General Assembly, you know, together with the UN Secretary uh, General and so on. It is very much on, I think, one's courage and initiative to do what is good. There is no inhibition of not to do good things and so on. Thank you. Hi, can I also come in? Um, hello? Hi, yes. Hi, talk. yes. Yes, uh, thank you. I also want to respond. Um, you, you, I mean, how I see now is that China has, China and Russia have hijacked the Security Council, whereas 
they're using the ASEAN, especially using the Cambodian chairmanship, having Hun Sen at the front line, hijacking the ASEAN's agenda as well. What we really need now is, yes, we, we have to keep pushing the uh, Security Council members to really uh, come, like a, come, come together and, and look for the options and strategy. But also what we really need is individual countries to show their leadership. The, the countries of democracies like Norway need to show the leadership outside of the UN platform. Why not? I mean, the reality is, do we keep pushing until China and Russia not their heads when the whole Myanmar is completely come to the ash by this military hunter? Or do we actually take the step and stand Individually, like-minded democracy countries coming together, form a coalition of like-minded, why not? So I think this is a matter of, like uh, Mr. Chris Chidori also said, is it's a matter of like also the uh, responsibility to protect. If we cannot use the platforms as the, 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 is, as the Security Council is defunct, then we have to find other ways. What we really need is the political will and political support of the individual countries. And that is what we continue to be seeing lagging with. And that's something we need the Norway to, to step up, including, you know, like um, not giving the legitimacy to this hunter, also cutting off all the financial ties and also the revenues going to the military hunter must be actually, you know, like a stop. So really need the, um, the Norway also within domestic sphere to take, to, to take up that leadership and responsibility, but also like, you know, including, for example, this, my proposal of the universal jurisdiction, like Argentina. Argentina, a small country far away in South America is taking up this case. Why not Norway, who has been at the forefront for Myanmar all along. In fact, uh, Norway was first initial and the, 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 the largest peace donor, or the, the, yeah, I mean, one of the largest peace donors to the Myanmar peace process of the last 10 years, which actually now tend to be, uh, you know, so you see where everything's are in the country, yeah? So I think what I'm trying to say is not putting the burden on, on Norway, but just to reflect for, for Norway to come back, to take that step up with their leadership in, in their, not only the, 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 in the next coming 10 days and 10, 10 months, but really just starting now, I guess. Thank you. Just I may, I might just one other comment on the Security Council. Um, I mentioned that the Security Council has not passed one resolution on Myanmar. So far as I'm aware, there has never even been one resolution on Myanmar put up to the Security Council. Uh, states that are concerned about the situation in Myanmar pull back and say, oh, it, it'll be vetoed. And so it's not even put up. You know, it's, it's time that the members of the Security Council, all 15 of them, were held to account by being required to put up their hands for or against a resolution. But they all play these diplomatic nice guy games. We're past that. Some state, whether it's the traditional leader on Myanmar, the United Kingdom, or one of the states like Norway, needs to say, we're going to have a resolution, we're going to put up a resolution. If you guys don't want to support it, let the whole world see. There's no reason why Security Council can't be held to account in the same way as we're expecting the Myanmar military to be held to account, and for exactly the same reason. Um, Ms. Uh, Yasmin, Ula, you, you raised your hands. Well. Um, Mr. Chris Sidoti already covered that. Thank you. There is one question here. The next, uh, next president, you see, of uh, the UN Security Council will be Russia uh, that Norway will be handing over to. What what happens next here now? What what can Norway do after next eleven days uh, to push this agenda further? And, and what can other countries do? Anyone that wants to? Comment I'll on? I'll be quick again, in, including Myanmar specifically, in the discussion of protection of civilians in armed conflict. Having the special session on Myanmar on the 28th of January and going into that, that, that debate with a commitment to presenting a resolution. And I have suggested taking up the issue of human rights defenders and civil society. 
Yes, Russia will be the president in February. Um, February's only got 28 days, so it's a short presidency. But then we have the United Kingdom in March and we have the United States in April. Um, the pressure will be on the UK and the US. They're P5s. They're not like Norway. They're permanent members. And they have to deliver in March and April. Um, but they should be delivering on the basis of the leadership that Norway shows this month. Thank you. Any other comments on that? Anyone would contribute on that? If I can just come in very quickly on that Russia as well, I, I, I like I was saying. I think um, what I what I I do engage with the different missions in New York. So I you know like when I observe, uh, what I feel um, is that the, uh, the 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 Security Council members uh, who are actually the at the forefront of this uh, women, peace, and security, or the, you know like uh, democracy countries. I think it's really important that they take more steps and keep kind of pushing rather than kind of already, you know, like uh, saying like, oh, they, Russia and China will always block. Yes, of course, we all know Russia and China will always block, but it doesn't mean the other countries cannot push. I think what we've been uh, also calling for is uh, please go ahead and, you know, table the resolution, go for it. And, you know, I mean, even honestly, even if China and Russia, uh, the, the resolution is not passed because China and Russia or even perhaps India, let's say if they block and if they don't vote, at least we know as the people of Myanmar, we deserve to know who stands with us. We deserve to know, people of Myanmar deserve to know who, who, who really support us, who have the really full political and other support behind the people of Myanmar's struggle for democracy. So this is what we are lacking. So I think like regardless of what China and Russia will do, what we want to see is how the other democracy countries, members of the Security Council will take up and take the stand for the people of Myanmar, regardless of what China and Russia will do. So that's what we really want to see. Thank you. Thank you. And, and it is important that Norway um, put resolution to the table that, that no matter how it will be, the response will be. And I think that's just the message, message from here. We are uh, moving towards uh, the end here. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if I can give the floor back to each of the speakers for a final round of comments uh, and, uh, and, and, and where you can say something about you reflected on the, on the discussion you heard from each other. And um, I'm wondering if I can give the floor first to uh, your Excellency, Minister uh, Susanna Lalazo. Uh, yes, um, I would like to urge uh, Norway and also the democracy countries and international communities to take action quickly because we start, uh, we start with like peaceful resolution. Uh, the crisis of Myanmar, but the lives, the people of lives could not wait. So um, we would like to avoid the conflict as much as we can. And we would like to go with like um, the international support of the democracy, stand firm and, and uh, act action uh, for Myanmar to raise the agenda in the top priority because the people of Myanmar want it. They struggle for nearly half of decades. And with the last coup, we stand nearly one year. So uh, the lives are very precious. And also this time is very uh, important. You know, all are united. The people of Myanmar all are united. And uh, especially the women leadership is very prominent. They are in the front line, in demonstration, in strike. And uh, I know that uh, there's a women network in every towns and every villages helping humanitarian aids and protection of the villages. So this time is very important and urgent need 
for the protection and help and stand for democracy restoring for our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And I pass on the word to uh, Ms. Uh, Yasmin Ula. Thank you. Um, I would like to re-emphasize that the protection of women shouldn't just be a policy point that is used to uplift the ideals of democracy and equality only in paper. Um, it should be realized regardless of the challenges and obstacles uh, one may find in the international mechanism. If Myanmar continues to spiral downwards, um, and we will if there isn't enough urgency and actions that follow suit from Norway and its allied nations, uh, Rohingya people, uh, myself, and marginalized ethnic communities will not have hopes of their situations and uh, their uh, plight being addressed anytime soon. So it isn't just one problem that we're seeing. The, the problem that we have been seeing is, is the issue that, that bind us all together. And if we really, really want to get to a point where we can talk about transitional justice and recuperating from, from this you know, from the coup and from the military regime, we need to be able to think long-term and, and, and actually imagine a possibility of this being addressed at the UN Security Council and, and much more. Many thanks, uh, Um I'll give the floor then to um, Ms. Ken Umar. Thank you. Um, like I, I, what I would like to say is, I really would like to uh, request the Norwegian government to reflect the past ten years of its support to the Myanmar peace process. There are so much lesson to learn to see where Myanmar is now and what we have missed in those ten years of the peace process. There were so many lessons to learn. What if, for example, women were supported at the forefront of the peace process? What if the communities vulnerable or impacted by the conflict and civil war were given a priority of their voices and their concerns are addressed in the peace process where these you know, people's voices, people's desires were given priority or not neglected or left out? There are many of those ifs. I think those ifs should be our guiding principles for what we should do next to address the crisis in Myanmar. And I look forward to the Norwegian leadership in this reflecting and learning lesson of the past 10 years, but also from based on that, take the next steps in a very concrete and concerted effort and way of joining hands with the Myanmar people as the Myanmar people will, are determined and will continue to strive for democracy and peace and justice. Thank you. Many thanks. And uh, I give the floor to uh, His Excellency, Ms. Kasit Jeromia. Two points. The, the first point is that I, I know that the new UN Special Envoy for Myanmar, Madame uh, Noreen Hessen, will be presenting her whatever finding or report to the UNSC on the 28th of January. And I hope that uh, she will be able to work with Norway and other members of the permanent, uh, the, what you call the UN Security Council. That's the first point. Second is that uh, I would like to suggest that uh, uh, Kin Omar and I think on the um, Myanmar friends and so on have a joint letter to the Thai Prime Minister second to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and third to the Chairperson of the Thailand National Human Rights uh, Commission, and telling the three of them of the situation in Myanmar, and at the same time urging them to work with the Myanmar people for democracy, for human rights, for humanitarian assistance, and so on. I think you should try to have a direct contact with the three Thai major institutions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, Chris, word is yours. Thanks, Justin. States have failed, but for the last year, people have been strong and they have been successful. Uh, the, the courage and the determination of the people of Myanmar has been nothing short of miraculous um, or inspiring over the last year. Uh, never before in Myanmar has there been such unity, such strength and such determination uh, for democracy and freedom. Um, young people have taken the lead in ways never seen before in Myanmar. The role of women, um, the, the leadership that we are seeing across the political spectrum has been extraordinary. Uh, outside Myanmar, there has been enormous support. People in the community, human rights groups, religious groups, women's groups, um, have been very vocal. Um, the arts have been particularly significant in many countries. Uh, I, I know, Justin, your own organisation is sponsoring an art exhibition on Myanmar in um, Bergen from the end of next week for two months. I mean, the arts community has been getting behind what's happening in Myanmar. It's time for governments to catch up with their people. We, we've waited too long. We're fed up with them. Governments have got to catch up because the people are strong and determined and will not give up. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to our panelists. We are also very glad to have, we have with us uh, both uh, government representatives and uh, academics and NGOs and, and journalists following uh, our discussion here today. Uh, we are very glad that Norway is also represented among the participants uh, in this webinar. And we are very glad that uh, uh, Ms. Thea uh, Martina Utman from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs is also uh, uh, asked to, uh, to, to make a comment um, on this, which is also quite um, welcome given the focus on Norway here. So Thea, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Thea Altman. I'm the special representative for Myanmar and I'm very pleased that I could address this important meeting today and we were so active that we actually asked to address you and we, we are very pleased to, to attend and we really have carefully listened to all the interventions and many of them heartbreaking. We are extremely worried about this ongoing situation in Myanmar and in the Security Council, we have consistently condemned the military's targeted violence and reprisals against women protesters and human rights defenders. And we continue to condemn the military coup in the strongest possible terms and reiterate our call on the military leadership to immediately end all forms of violence and abuses against the people of Myanmar. The escalation of violence has dire consequences for the civilian population. We see increasing humanitarian needs and the access is very difficult. We are in close dialogue with our many humanitarian partners and have increased our humanitarian aid. Norway is deeply concerned about the situation in Myanmar and believes that it merits the attention and action of the UN Security Council. Therefore, we have been working actively for Myanmar to be on the agenda and to be very active in terms of what the council actually can do. And as we have the presidency this month, we also hope to have a council meeting on Myanmar at the end of the month, close to the one year after the coup. We believe it's crucial that the ones most affected by violence and conflict are given the opportunity to engage directly with the members of the Security Council. Therefore, we have invited briefers, especially female briefers from civil society to address the Council. And yesterday, our Foreign Minister chaired the signature event on Women, Peace and Security, and the Foreign Minister also chaired a separate meeting on Myanmar, as you can see in the biggest newspaper in you. In, in Norway today, uh, after Boston. So please be assured that Norway continues a long-standing and strong commitment for the people of Myanmar. We follow the situation closely and remain deeply concerned for the civilian population. And we will continue to be active as we have been to keep Myanmar on the Security Council's agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, oh. Susanna? 
Uh, yeah, I just you. would like to thank uh, Ms. Pierre for uh, the commitment, the commitment uh, of uh, Noe government and herself. Thank you. Can I also uh, give a very quick comment? Thanks for also uh, sharing with us uh, the Norway's uh, effort in uh, Security Council. Um, we saw the Norway um, social media engagement uh, on the meeting with the Myanmar ambassador, the, the permanent representative, Myanmar's permanent representative, Ambassador John Moton. Uh, that was uh, positive, of course, but it's, we feel, we, we, we would like for you to also note that we still feel very discouraged that our ambassador is still not able to take the seat where he belongs to represent the people of Myanmar. We would like to seek your full political support in the next coming uh, thematic session on civilian in armed conflict, which we understand scheduled for the 25th. We really hope to see your full political support to our ambassador that he can take the seat on behalf of the Myanmar people and address the situ situation of the civilian yeah. armed conflict. Yeah. And I think that's also where we will be more confident uh, with the you know like a coming step. So we look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to uh, Thea for uh, adding the voice of Norway. I think that was very welcome. I think we have, uh, we've had uh, some um, excellent discussions and interventions here. And we are close to one year since the coup in Myanmar. And during that time, we have on one hand seen people unite. We have seen people mobilize. We have, seen braveness, people risking their lives for democracy and for human rights. And we have seen a uh, new uh, government being formed, uh, which uh, seeks to unite across ethnic uh, diversity. And on the other hand, we've seen a brutal crackdown from a government that doesn't shy, seem to shy away from enemies uh, to uh, to maintain control. And, and I think that discussions we have heard here today really underscores uh, the urgency uh, for action at an international level. And I think also the, the expectations of Norway at the Security Council, but, but also expectations growing out of the long-term commitment that Norway have had for Burma and Myanmar. And so, so I'm, I'm, there are many issues we, would, uh, we could have discussed for a long time here now. Uh, I'm glad to see a lot of engagement on the, on the Q&A and on the chat here. Uh, and we, we, I just want to underline what from us and the organizers that we are willing to, uh, to continue that conversation. Please get in touch with us if you want to have follow-up meetings or or, or discuss this with us after this meeting. We are uh, very open to that and we we'll welcome that. But for now, I would like to thank the speakers, to all the participants, uh, and, uh, and also on behalf of the Rafter Foundation, also thank our co-organizers, uh, the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, Progressive Voice, and ASEAN Burma. Uh, and also to Debbie for uh, stepping in uh, in the beginning of the meeting here. Thank you very much, uh, Myanmar. We will continue to make sure Myanmar stays on the agenda. From the Rafter Foundation, we've been doing that for 30 years, and, and we will continue to do that. And thank you very much to all of you who were with us today. Thank you all. Thank you, Justin. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Thea, very much for your intervention.